Um, but this is a roadmap to precision medicine. I'm Florina Gobel. I'm the president of the Center for Contemporary Sciences. And I have these lovely folks here for a panel discussion on uh, animal-free precision medicine. So um, we're very excited to kick this off with you here. Um, so first off, briefly, we've got Dr. Aisha Akhtar, Dr. Ellen Berg, Dane Goebel from Methuselah as well. And we'd love to hear actually a bit of your origin stories. We're at the World Stem Cell Summit. We're in a place with very bright people and scientists. Uh, but the thing that I always want to know is people's origin story with their line of interest, their study, their area of study. What inspired you uh, and um, drove the trajectory of your careers? Ellen, would you like to kick that off? Sure. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Ellen Burke. Um, I am a long, long time um, uh, scientific leader in translational biology, mostly human cell based assays. Um, I worked in animal models and in, in human clinical, uh, clinical uh, data as well and recognized very early how different human biology is than, than, um, than animals. And also in developing assays that were disease models, they would model aspects of disease. Um, I could see the value of the data from those assays when combined and mapped to the clinical would absolutely take precision medicine off. And meanwhile, we're still mired in the animal data world trying to make it fit. Let's stop trying to make animal data fit human biology and let's go for, uh, for real scaled uh, assays uh, and data and and the systems that we need the infrastructure to put that data together in a smart way so um, uh, that's kind of where where I am today I go next hi everyone yeah. my name is Aisha I'm a neurologist and a public health specialist and I always tell everyone there's two reasons why I'm, I'm doing the work that I do one is and you can look me up I'm an animal advocate I care deeply about protecting animals and the suffering of animals. And I've always wanted, I've dedicated my life to help reduce the suffering that we inflict on other animals. I'm also a physician and a human advocate. And I've spent 10 years in, at the Food and Drug Administration overseeing drug and vaccine safety and efficacy testing. And then I was um, deputy director of the Army's traumatic brain injury program for several years before I launched the Center for Contemporary Sciences just as everyone was being sent home at the beginning of the pandemic. So not exactly the best time to start a new nonprofit organization. But when I was at the FDA, I can't tell you how many times we saw again and again a new drug coming through the pipeline that people would say, this is gonna be the next big breakthrough for stroke. This is gonna be it. This is gonna be the, the breakthrough for this disease and this disease and so on and so on. Everyone would get excited because it worked in animals only for them to fail in human clinical trials. And then in the Army, you know, you can imagine that traumatic brain injury is a major problem for soldiers, not just the US soldiers, but soldiers worldwide, as well as non-soldiers, right? And despite the fact that the Army had the military spent hundreds of millions of dollars in doing head injury experiments in animals, we don't have a single effective treatment for head injury. We have symptom treatment for the symptoms, for some of the symptoms, but nothing that actually treats head injury. And so, you know, if these kinds of two passions and, and uh, you know, recognitions on my part really started me on this path to think about, is there a better way to do medical research? And, you know, as, a, as I learned more and more about the process, you really start to see that there are, despite the similarities between humans and rats and dogs and cats and non-human primates, there's still too many differences. And so we're at this point in medicine where it's the subtle nuances in differences that are causing these translational problems. You can't fix them short of actually turning a rat into a human being. You cannot fix these problems. So what we do at the at our Center for Contemporary Science is really help develop an ecosystem that supports the discovery, the development, 
the validation, the um, refinement and improvement, standardization, and ultimately the use of what we call human relevant testing methods that are methods that are based on human biology. We'll, we can talk a little bit about some of those. These are the ones that we really propose are going to be the game changers in medical research that are really going to transform us and get us into that era of precision, personalized medicine that I think we're all, you know, are all trying to get to. Thank and you. Dane, especially with your, we do have um, longevity folks here at this conference as well. We'd love to hear your personal why um, and your involvement in animal-free precision medicine as well. Sure, sure. So when, when Methuselah got started um, about 20 years ago, obviously, the, the focus uh, was on aging, and that's still uh, a major focus. But as time has gone by and technology has gotten better, you know, um, in particular, this was an area that we started looking at. Um, because it's just absolutely insane how much it costs to bring a drug to market and how many lives are you know, lost while they're waiting for something just purely out of um, technological uh, issues or uh, economic issues. It's just profoundly nuts. So it's now at the point where it's, it seems, at least, at least to us, that there's enough uh, proof of, of, uh, of concept, enough companies that are out there that have take, taken the technology far enough where it's time to really try to make this something that's more of a more of a standard and it, it's, it's it's understandable why the paradigm was uh the, the way it has been for a long time that's that's okay you know it takes time for things to progress but it's it's pretty close now um and so yeah like like i said we, you know we're focused we're focused on aging but really um it's now at this stage i think that you know we want to do whatever we can to try to create a, a level playing field so you can have more drugs uh, come to market faster cheaper and you know help people you know Live. I think that's a great a great segue since you touched on cost. Let's let's talk about some of the fundamental problems with the the uh, drug R and D process uh, right now. So we have a slide up here. On average, we have, it's one to five billion dollars per drug or therapeutic. Ten to fifteen years to develop a drug and for it to hit the market, and a ninety to a ninety five percent failure rate. Um, so, ladies, can we can we expound on this? why this is so problematic. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll let you talk about the clinic, speeding up clinical trials. But, you know, in early discovery, people just take too long making decisions. And they're taking too long making decisions because they make them, uh, all the data and information is siloed, and it moves on to the next step. And these are very standardized steps. And what we're not doing is doing our assessment of a drug really, really broadly early. So you get a, a much better picture very early in, in drug discovery. And so not only will you only take things forward that are gonna work, you'll take them forward much faster. And these uh, in vitro and in silico uh, uh, tools just can operate 10 times faster than it takes to set up an animal study, get the paperwork done, and run the study, and then have a couple of weeks, months, people doing analysis, especially if it's any transcriptional analysis. It's crazy. Um, we don't need those studies. They are not decision making. Well, people are making decisions, but they're making the wrong decisions. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in early discovery to really uh, um, shorten the timelines and, and not bring things into development that are going to fail. I personally don't care how much it costs a pharmaceutical company to develop a drug. <laughs> um, you know, um, I'm not crying for, for pharmaceutical companies, but unfortunately the high cost is passed on to us, right, and, the, and to consumers. And so it's that, that 90 to 95% failure rate, you think about that, this is Basically, because the FDA requires every new drug, with rare exception, to be tested on two different species for safety and efficacy before they can move on to human clinical trials, then 90 to 95 percent of them fail in human clinical trials, and about 30 to 40 percent fail because of safety problems um, that were not 
found earlier, and the rest, um, about you know, 50% will fail because of lack of efficacy, and maybe about 10% will fail because of some other, some other reasons, um, business-related reasons. But so you think about that, that means that the animal testing is not predicting human outcomes up to 90 to 95% of the time. And here's an analogy I always tell people. I mean, imagine if you were to hop on a plane and a pilot said, all right, strap down because we have less than 5% chance of landing safely at our destination. Everyone would hop off and immediately demand an overhaul of the entire airline industry. But for some reason, we've accepted this kind of failure rate with drug development and vaccine development. It doesn't have to be that. And so we really do believe that there is a real role here in changing this paradigm. It's not gonna happen overnight. It's going to take work. It's going to take more funding, more investment, more effort, more people educated in how to use new tools, develop new tools, but that's where the future of medicine is gonna be, and that's where we're really hopeful um, that we can develop better, better precise tools that are based on human biology. Just to, to add on to that, yeah, I'm not I'm not crying for for big pharma either. It's it's an awful lot more like I'm crying for the 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 giant pile of amazing scientists who are out there who are successful at raising you know the ten million dollars it takes to get the research done, and then they they are starving when they're trying to raise the hundred million dollars that it requires to you know do a few clinical trials to de-risk things for your investors. Like that's that's absolutely insane, and then you end up with this really fantastic environment for big pharma. They can come in and be predatory, wait for, wait for the, the work to start to fizzle, and then they come in and they say, oh, we'll take that IP off your hand, sure. Yeah. So, so again, it's really just like, like you guys were saying, it's just the, the speed of things. It's, it's absolutely nuts. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm for it too. I'll stop talking. Okay, great. So, you know, my question is, so why, what is it about human relevant? And it, Aisha, please feel free to, to define what those human relevant methodologies are. Why are they so critical for life sciences, for the, the field of longevity, uh, and for pharmaceutical companies? Why is it so critical for, for these methodologies to take hold? Well, so, that, you know, I'm sure many people have heard of organoids and organ on a chip technology, and these are the ones that are kind of catch, catchy catching a lot of excitement. And you know they're not gonna solve all the answers. They're not perfect by any means, but they could definitely use more um, funding and effort into continual improvement. Um, and they will need to be integrated with many other diff different methodologies. So it's not gonna take one type of method that's gonna solve all the problems. It's gonna take a combination of different methods. But the, 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 the benefit of them is that they are based on human tissues and human cells. And so if you think about this, what, what I love about the idea about like an organ on a chip or a body on a chip technology, let's say you have a lung on a chip, a kidney on a chip, a mini brain on a chip, gut on a chip, a vascular system on a chip, a neurological system on a chip, I mean this is where we're, we're, we're heading, right? And so you can get to an era of running clinical trials basically in the lab using these techniques before you actually do live clinical trials in live people. So you can capture my cells and create an Aisha on a chip, conceivably, a Florina on a chip, right? A Dane on a chip. You can do a rat on a chip. You can do my cat tumbles on a chip if you wanted to. And you can run clinical trials capturing human diversity before we actually have to try these things in live human beings. And then, of course, that also helps us get into that era of personalized medicine, where you can actually get to a point where we can screen and, and start to develop treatments based on my biological profile and drugs and screen drugs against my diseases and, and so on. So this is, you know, this is why this is so important. The system is broke right now. And so many people have been calling out that the system is broke. One of the things we did to help to start fixing the system at Center for Contemporary Science is we um, helped draft language for a new bill that was actually signed into law in December by Biden. It's called the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. And basically what it does is it goes to back to a 1938 law that required that animal testing had to be done 
for new drugs. And it just updates that law. I mean, that was 1938. Animal testing was what we knew in 1938. So what we did is we updated it by just changing the word animal to non-clinical. So essentially, the FDA Modernization Act expands the type of methods conceivably that a drug developer could use and could submit to the FDA. So it, it doesn't take away animal testing, but it just allows for other opportunities. So this is the first step to start kind of changing this, this paradigm that we're in currently and start to think about other ways of testing. There are other ways that we can start thinking of how we conduct medical research. And just, just to add on to that, um, I am personally very passionate about this program and this prize that we're going to talk about here briefly um, in a bit because of all of, the, of all of my family and friends who have passed before their time, they all died of terminal cancer. They all died of cancer. And um, a couple of them were scientists. And to me, I, I made a promise that I would do everything I could to help advance solutions, um, ideally for personalized medicine, so that drugs could be tailored and tested on their tissue without them having to go through painful clinical trials to see if it will work as a last Hail Mary. Um, unfortunately, I'd had to watch up close and personal um, the pain that they went through in these clinical trials, and then they wound up dying anyway. And so wouldn't it be great if there could be more shots on goal because of these uh, technologies that exist, that have, you know, that exist now, that didn't exist in the 1930s going forward, uh, that, I mean, we can sort of fifth element this. <laughs> and drugs could hit the market far faster, far cheaper, and have much more robust data in terms of its efficacy. Um, that's, that's the goal, correct? Am I, am I incorrect there? Yeah, um, okay, so, uh, what, so in terms of progress, um, what progress has been made that will help open the door for human relevant methodologies to take hold in the, in the industry? Just, just real quick, so I've got to run or Bernie's going to yell at me. So I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll be back in like five minutes. Okay, great. Do you want to answer that, Ellen? So I mean, I, you know, we talked about some of the new methodologies that are being created. So Emulate is one of the companies that's created Oregon on a chip technology, and they actually published a study in Nature Communications in December, which I would highly recommend. Basically, they looked at 27 drugs that have already gone through the entire process, 13 of which were found to have severe liver toxicity. They all passed the animal tests and then were found to have severe liver toxicity, so severe that it required um, organ transplants, led to deaths or end or significant post-marketing like black box labeling or withdrawing from the market. And they, they basically used their like 800 liver chips to see how well their liver chips compared to the animal testing um, in predicting this liver toxicity. So the animal testing, zero prediction, zero sensitivity in, in capturing the liver toxicity. And their liver chips had a sensitivity of 87%. So that's a huge, huge advantage and a specificity of 100%, meaning that they didn't mislabel something as being unsafe when it actually was safe. So that's just one example. And you know, one of the things we always hear from people is, you know, we're not there yet, you know, it's all great, and blah, 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 we're not there yet. We're not there yet because we're not putting the effort to be there yet. And so that's why, you know, as a, I would say, as a scientific advocacy organization, we are trying to get that effort to be there. We are trying to increase government funding, investment. We can get there. We just need to, to, to put our efforts into it, and we can get there to that personalized medicine that's so much better for all of us. Again, um, I wanted to point out that a lot of these technologies are, have, that have been developed, they're around. And they've been mostly used in early discovery, like for target discovery, in phenotypic drug discovery screens, or in you know early mechanism of action type of type of projects. Um, so drug discoverers are really familiar with these technologies, but they once a drug has reached or a 
program has reached a certain stage, it sort of goes over the fence to the preclinical, and none of that data comes along with it, so, which is potentially predictive and would help reduce the use of animals. They don't bring over that data to check to see um, you know, if it perform, if it can reduce, uh, reduce the, the, the next steps. And um, so one of, the th one of the things that needs to be done is to get this data more available for drugs when they're going to the FDA so that it's got much more characterization across these systems. That would benefit everyone because testing uh, many, many drugs in any system tells you actually, because you know the mechanisms of those drugs, tells you about the system itself. So you're building your knowledge of biology while you're doing, you're not just testing, black box testing, which most animal studies are, black box, yes or no. Um, you're actually building your, your knowledge of the mechanisms and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the greater understanding of that disease and or you know, toxicity. So the value of bringing those technologies that are being used in high throat screaming, in hit triage, lead up, early stages, um, and collecting all that data and, and building up these data sets is gonna be a powerful driver for, um, for precision medicine. Wonderful, so really briefly, Aisha, I would love for you to sort of, at a high level, go over this roadmap for precision medicine. What we envision to be the way that things could progress to, for us actually hitting that sixth phase of true precision medicine, Mark. Yeah, so this is something that we're doing in concert with the Methuselah Foundation, and Dane will come back and talk about one aspect of, of this, but um, you know, this is a, a very high level kind of roadmap, and we're gonna be working on creating a much more detailed roadmap and action plan to get us to phase six, initially to phase four. And so we're looking at where all the, um, the, the hurdles are right now to get to phase six. And so whether it's financial hurdle, meaning government funding, private investment, whether it's a, um, an education hurdle. So we know that there is a not as strong a workforce, a scientific workforce that is as familiar with some of these newer technologies and compared to like animal model testing, um, policy hurdles, like the FDA Modernization Act was just the very beginning of starting to, to erase some of the policy hurdles. Um, so we're, we're looking at the different ways that we can start to move the mark. So it, it's not just a financial, it's not just a scientific issue, it's a policy issue, it's an education issue, it's a cultural issue too, because I know, you know, we're, we're in a scientific community that's used to doing things a certain way, and you know, we have a regulatory system that's used to doing things a certain way, so it's gonna take a cultural shift to move away from relying on animal testing and using more and more of these other types of methods. So this is kind of just a high level roadmap but we will be developing a more detailed roadmap. If anyone wants to join us and be part of our coalition, we would welcome you. So um, since he's back, uh, Methuselah Foundation is known for International Open Innovation Prize Challenges. Um, Dean, can you talk about the lightning rod that's in store for human relevant <laughs> solutions for drug development, disco discovery and development? There. Sounds, yeah. sounds kind of scary. Um, yeah, well, I can, I can go, like, so that's actually kind of neat. We just got an update to the rules this morning. So in short, for now, it hopefully will be a little bit more than this, but it's, it's a million dollar challenge with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, milestone awards that are gonna be given out. Um, it's always better to uh, give out lots of, lots of awards to lots of teams than to just one, one big one at the end. Um, but the, the, it's really, it's, so it's three, three, uh, three rounds. The first one is uh, doing controls. You need to have uh, companies can, it's, I mean, we're trying to be somewhat agnostic about approach, so it can be tissue on, tissue on a chip, it can be organoids, it can be kind of whatever you'd like. It can be in silico. There's gonna be some, some more details about how that's gonna uh, be judged a little bit differently. But the first round is, is controls. Technologies will be tested against five compounds that have been approved for use in humans and you have to have at least 50% uh, accuracy just to qualify. Uh, and then you go down to acute toxicity. 
technologies will be tested against 10 compounds that have been identified as having acute toxicity uh, that either uh, have passed animal trials but failed human trials, or passed animal and human trials to be proved for use but then were removed from the market because of long-term toxicity. And then the final round is chronic toxicity. Uh, technologies will be tested against 10 compounds that have been identified as having long-term chronic toxicities. And all of these compounds have been approved for market after passing human trials, but then um, re removed uh, over time. So, and and yeah. did you want to add that there, you're targeting three organ systems? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah, so, uh, so renal, uh, cardiac, and, uh, and hepatic, right? So, um, so that's, that's like the, those are the broad strokes. You know, these, the rules aren't, uh, it's, it's not totally finalized. So anybody who has good ideas, we're very, very happy to take them on board. And thankfully we have very, very, very smart ladies here are going to help us out quite a bit in, in defining the, 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 the finer, uh, finer details. So, yeah. So yeah. Wonderful. Dane, I think it would be good if you talked about the vascular tissue prize as a, you know, kind mm. of a, oh, sure. a background to this. Yeah, Agreed. sure. So the <laughs> vascular tissue challenge was fun. It was really the, um, the product of five years of trying to do a whole organ engineering challenge, and it was too early and there wasn't enough money. Uh, and so it ended up making sense to, to kind of scale down the vision just a hair and focus on a key rate limiter. So a key rate limiter uh, that, we, that made the most sense to look at was microvasculature. And so uh, once, once that was kind of uh, became clear, uh, we were put in touch with some lovely folks at uh, NASA uh, who were also interested in the same sort of thing. And so we ended up doing a relatively small challenge. It was a $500,000 challenge, but it was actually won by some fantastic people at Wake Forest. Uh, Wake Forest, two teams at Wake Forest um, made a centimeter cubed um, piece of living tissue. It stayed alive for 30 days. It's basically the equivalent of a, like a living hot dog. Um, fully functional fully, fully and outside functional, of the lab. Fully functional, vascularized, yeah. working tissue. Um, and so, yeah, after that was, that was only one uh, about a couple of years ago. Um, so we're gonna take a couple of those experiments to the ISS, which is which is nice. Um, and this this challenge is in some ways a follow-on to that. In it's in some ways, obviously, it's focused on uh, on drug development. But I think both both of these challenges kind of work nicely in terms of um, both tissue engineering, um, but um, also you know they're going to provide a lot of interesting, useful data um, for um, human avatar sorts of. Approaches. Eventually, like the holy grail is, you know, a digital human avatar that you can develop drugs for. And so, the, the more that you have the ability to personalize things, right, the more data, the more interesting data that you're going to have available. And, you know, with a little bit of luck, everything's just going to go in silico uh, over time. So, so yeah, that's, I, I think that hopefully clears things up okay. Excellent. So, t let's, let's talk more about, so Methuselah is leading the Animal Free Precision Medicine uh, International Innovation Prize, and Center for Contemporary Sciences is leading on the programmatic side, um, uh, uh, driving a policy and advocacy. We actually have another bill in the works that we're going to push forward this year that will build upon the FDA Modernization Act 2.0. But we're, we're making major strides in terms of building traction around human relevant methodology so that all boats can rise, not just in the longevity field, but in life sciences. So we get more shots and goal in actually solving prob real problems um, for people out there. And that's what I'm really into. And also um, opening it up for more than just the folks that we all know and are connected to to actually work on those problems, right? Um, the, the vascular tissue challenge was open to almost anyone who wanted to help solve that, that vasculature problem. And it was solved in a couple of years by some really great people here at the Wake Forest. But that's the kind of uh, innovation that we are looking to drive to through the prize and the program itself. Um, yeah, that's right. And one, one thing that we did uh, about five years, uh, well, about uh, 10, 10, 10 to five years um, ago that like, kind of ran alongside the vascular tissue, uh, vascular tissue challenge was the Organ Preservation Alliance. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, you know, we wanted to focus on organ in, whole organ engineering, but also organ preservation, goal being to eventually get rid of the organ uh, waiting list. Um, and in the process of, of getting that prize uh, started, we also were uh, able to help get an organization started that did, it was just, it was really advocacy and community building, but it, it ended up uh, getting $130 million allocated from 
uh, from the DOD to, to put towards it. So like in, in, a, in an ideal circumstance, like you, it's, uh, prizes are really, really fantastic for getting things going, um, but you need to have other programs that, that run alongside it so that people can pay for the party while they're doing the work. So with a, with a little luck, we'll see something like that happen as well. Wonderful. And the end goal in phase six is precision medicine, actual personalized drugs. Um, ethical drugs custom tested and made for patients and a great environment for that is space <laughs> as well so we're having very so we're, we're having uh, we're kicking off great conversations with space folks um, to get involved with this but we are we are casting quite a wide net because this effort definitely deserves it wonderful so um, any more points that you wanted to add Aisha Ellen no Okay, great. So we, I guess now would be a good time to kick off Q&A if anyone has questions. Great. Are there any countries outside of the U.S. that are making inroads on this that you can learn from? Um, so it depends on what part of the research paradigm you're talking about. So there are certain countries that are doing better as far as chemical testing and toxicity testing. Some that are doing, I think the, so I don't know, I don't know the, the nuances of the different countries, but maybe, do you know, Ellen? Well, in, in a lot of Europe there's, you know, OECD has been very strong in uh, safety area alternatives to animals. Organization for Economic Development, actually, of all things. It's a bureaucracy, big bureaucracy in Europe, and, and they're doing great work here in, in pushing for adoption of, of alternatives to animal testing when they're not working. Um, there's, there are um, efforts uh, in Canada, Canada, um, and I know in India there's a, a some effort as well in terms of the lobby side and, and promoting. On the technology development, that's a good question. I think it's... Mm. I know I was put in touch with uh, folks from Europe yeah. who, are, who are building upon, actually they got, they were given government funding, funding to establish centers of excellence for regenerative medicine with a special focus on microfluidics and organ on a chip technologies. So I, it, I, did remember in the Netherlands is actually probably a leader in this regard because the government is really behind this effort and they're really making a committed. It's not just you know speaking out of one side and the other. They're really making a committed effort to replace animal testing and not just replace it with something equal, but replace it with something better, right? And so that's they're they're really working on that. I will say that in. 2021, the European Parliament um, came, had a vote, and it was like something like it was an overwhelming vote that they, they had decided they wanted to phase out animal testing and replace it with more human relevant methods. Now, it's not a legally binding vote, but what it does is that it, it calls for a roadmap and a plan to phase out animal testing. So the European Parliament has definitely at least shown by their, by their voice that they, they want to start moving in this other direction. The US, you know, the US has kind of been a little bit behind in some, some regards, and this was a law that, you know, was pushed by the, the FDA Modernization Act, was pushed by advocacy groups like ours, and um, with some scientific communities involved, um, and, but it wasn't something that came up from the FDA itself, right? So it came from policymakers. But hopefully it's sending a good message that the world is starting to get ready. They, they want to start seeing some change. And I think that's at least what the, the policy does here. Uh, I see. Okay, Tina, I'm coming to you. And you have the benefit of being the last person to ask a question because this <laughs> illustrious group is about to get an award out there. And I was just letting know that I'm late. So I'm totally fascinated by this. And I just can't understand why, like, like you know, the longevity world aren't sort of grabbing this by the, you know, it seems so obvious. It's such a no-brainer. So what, what are the, sorry. I, so, <laughs> 
So what are the main challenges that you, I mean, is it availability? Is it sort of mindset? I mean, there's, there's still all the stuff being done in mice, you know, all the, the clock work and, and the biomarker work. So, yeah. There's two areas. There's a business, right? Because we develop all these technologies, but then to commercialize them is this, they're expensive, they're complicated, people don't understand them. That has been a huge hurdle in making them accessible. Then there's the whole kind of fairness of these technologies. Can you find them? Where are they? Um, are they accessible? Do I, can I even understand what, you know, that some of these, the way they describe them, it's like, I'm not sure what they are. Um, can I interpret all, can I understand, do I even understand the data? Is it, uh, can I compare my data to a reference? Um, and then one of the biggest values of these technologies is that you can build databases and learn from. These can drive these, um, you know, machine learning models you can use it as inputs so um, it's the business side and and making these accessible people and that's I think the Center for Contemporary Science is a great position to help uh, and so I guess the thing is is that these technologies are relatively novel right I mean so they're maybe 15 years old and they're just getting really like good right and and so they're still done by a few centers, but that's what we're trying to make them more pervasive. We want to help them make, make them more pervasive, and that's why we're here, and that's what Methuselah has been doing, is trying to communicate this with the longevity community, and that's what we're starting to do as well. Uh, Dr. Brian Kennedy, would you like to? You want to come in first? I was just going to say that we just started. A lot of why nobody knows about it is because we haven't been talking about it. So. Yeah. And, and we're honestly, just, we're just getting going. It's, it, I think fundamentally it's a human thing. It's fear of the unknown and the lack of a precedent. So what drug company has actually fully vested in human relevant technologies and shown success? So once that starts happening, there will be a tipping point, is my supposition. So uh, let me first say I think most of what you're doing is great. And I agree with them. most the vast majority of it. And we need to move in this direction. Um, but. First of all, I don't think 90 to 95% of trials, t trials fail only because animal models are bad models for humans. There are all kinds of other reasons that trials fail, including esoteric regulatory rules and pharmaceutical companies that don't want to spend the money in the right places. Or you know, We could go on and on about that, and you don't have time because you have to get your warrant. Um, second of all, uh, I think that these things are going to prove to be complementary and not replacing animal models in some contexts. For instance, fundamental biology, which has driven most of our knowledge about things. Uh, and when you look at personalized medicine uh, and where it's worked well is in cancer. And that's in part because tumors can be taken out of the body and we can sequence individual tumors. It's in part because we've spent a gazillion dollars on animal models and learned about a lot of fundamental biology of cancer. Now, whether that translates directly to testing a drug or not is one thing, but when it comes to learning the fundamental tool, fundamental knowledge you need to understand a disease or aging, it's hard to replace animal models there. And I, I'll, I'll just leave you with the thought that if you're gonna study longevity, as, as I've been doing for a long time, if you wanna study it outside of an animal, I would really like to hear what the assay is to measure that, because I don't think there's any consensus in the longevity field right now for that. Mm -hmm. So Brian, I'm, I'm gonna disagree with what you, you disagreed with. Um, so the 90 to 95% failure rate is actually coming out from NIH, and there are several papers that have shown that. So it's based on the preclinical results, um, and most of the decision-making is based on the animal study results with the FDA regulatory process. So that means that when you have a failure, it's because it, it, it's a failure despite the animal testing. The other thing I would say is that I do agree that it's probably going to be complementary for now with the animal testing until the rest of the industry and the scientific community becomes more and more comfortable with using these novel technologies, I believe they are going to be used complementary to the existing animal testing. But I do also believe that they are going to be surpassing and um, taking over the animal testing as time goes on. And as far as basic biology, well, 
I mean, you're, you're studying longevity in a mouse that lives four years. And it, it doesn't make sense to me, or two years, and it doesn't make sense to me. And, and you know, it, you're also studying in a, in a biological system, if you will, for which we don't know what we don't even know. So it's not like we're using a fixed mathematical model that we can control and we can manipulate the, the parameters on and understand what we're manipulating. We're looking at biological systems that we don't even know, we don't fully understand. And when you're, you're dealing with a biological system like that, I mean, that, that's what leads to so many of the translation problems that we face. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, from my perspective, the Methuselah Foundation started the M Prize, the, Ma the Methuselah Mouse Prize, right? Um, the fundamental things that we know about aging and other diseases were built off of animal research. It's incredibly, that was incredibly valuable. But if there are alternatives that are more progressive technologically, that will wind up being cheaper, give you cleaner results, uh, be much more accurate, and uh, are far superior in almost every other way and wind up being cheaper in the long run, then would it not be a great thing to adopt? If everything you just said is true, I'm, I'm on board. Yeah, yeah. That's what, so we're, we're looking to test that out with the AFPM prize in this program um, and are really excited to, de to deliver what we find. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I'll just make one, one last comment. We've yeah. got to think about what are the differences between our animal models and people, especially with longevity? You know, we live decades, right? Our animal species that we're studying for most mice and rats, you know, live very short lives. Humans have developed all kinds of other mechanisms to handle DNA damage that rodents don't need, right? So we've got a lot of, so we're not, we need to tap, how do we find those mechanisms? Um, we're a lot larger than these animals. So we've got other, like our whole cardiovascular system has other mechanisms to help us get blood to the tissues where, you know, at a mouse it could basically diffuse. And um, the third is the environment, right, right? We live in a dirty, people live in dirty, dirty world, right? We're exposed to animals and other people and microbes and COVID and the elements. things. Mm -hmm. Whereas our animal models that we're working with are in a super clean environment, right? Very clean. They only live in like cages with their little neighbors. So we're just missing a lot of biology. Well, so, and and, and the extra. How do we get just, to that extra there's biology? There's just no accepted assay outside of an organism to study longevity in the field right now. So until we get there, I don't know what to do. But you can study longevity mechanisms. You can study targets. You can study pathways. You, if you put it together with the clinical data, you can learn the picture. That's, that's so my Brian, pitch. Brian, help us find those assays. And that's what we're going to say. I, I'm help us create on, those I'm trying, assays. I'm trying to do yeah. that, too. But I'm yeah. still working in animals. Yeah. And that's what we're asking. I mean, we, we know there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's what we're, we're, we want to do. We want to help get that work done to help get to that point that where we can say, yeah, we have the best tools possible. I mean, we're, there's always gonna be improvement, but you know, where we can you know, feel confident with the tools that we have. So we, have, we invite you, we invite everyone to help us get there. Yeah. And I think developing these tools is great. Like I said from the beginning, I'm not against moving in this direction. Yeah, basically any, what we can do to de-risk the, the drug discovery and development process as much as possible. I mean, listening to longevity scientists talk about how any minor alteration of environment in their labs will also alter result, test results with the animals that they use. To me, that's really, that's hugely risky. And you, that's also very costly from, my, from what I've heard. So if we can de-risk that through human uh, relevant methodologies, why would we not press for it? Yeah, yeah. I agree that that works. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. We're, we're going to get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll wrap this up. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, let's, let's chat afterward. We've got to accept it. So everyone, word. please stay in, in the room. You know, we, my name is Bernie Siegel. I'm executive director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. And the news, the news is there's so much conference and so little time and so few rooms. So this was supposed to take place in, in the atrium. So I'm going to start in a second as we get plugged in. But we're going to be giving an honor to the Methuselah Foundation.
so please just stay in, stay here for a few minutes. So uh, if you've been attending the World Stem Cell Summit for, the, for this week, you will understand that a big component every year of the summit is something called the, the Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Action Awards. My name is Bernard Siegel, Bernie Siegel. I'm the executive director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. The predecessor organization was the Genetics Policy Institute I, that I founded. And we are the producers of the annual World Stem Cell Summit, which is now in its 20th edition, 20 years. So we've been spending 20 years, and one of the things that we realized that there was no one handing out, from a patient advocacy perspective, honors to, to those worthwhile organizations, advocacy organizations, grassroots advocacy, leadership, inspiration, media integrity. So we've given out more awards than I can, than I can even remember. So over these years, we've recognized organizations and individuals and past honorees have included leaders in philanthropy, advocacy, education, policy, including then former Vice President Joe Biden and Dr. Jill Biden for the Cancer Initiative, Bob Klein, the father of Prop 71 and Prop 14, Michael J. Fox, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, governors Jennifer Granholm, Martin O'Malley and Jim Doyle, Michigan, Maryland, and Wisconsin. We've recognized other organizations such as Research America, Hadassah, Huntington's Disease Grassroots Community, ALS Worldwide, Parkinson's Action Network, international awards as well. And you will see that we've provided awards uh, at this meeting to Governor Roy Cooper, who attended the other day, to a packed house, of course, because everyone in North Carolina loves the North Carolina governor, uh, with a leadership award. We also honored Taylor's Tale, a Batten's Disease Advocacy Organization, North Carolina based, that really was the inspiration of the North Carolina Rare Disease Network, the first in the nation, now being adopted as a model for many other states. So this universe of organizations is very, very important. So today we are honoring, especially because this was the day that Dane and, and Florina could be here, a National Advocacy Award to the Methuselah Foundation. This pioneering nonprofit organization incubates and sponsors ventures focused on longevity of science and extending the human health span is a major funder of biomedical research and supports innovation prizes to accelerate breakthroughs in longevity. We've heard about the M Prize. We've heard about the Animal Precision Medical Prize. These are so innovative, innovative prizes, competitions for longevity. It is the first major longevity movement, but also tied into industry, building in the industry, and tied in as supporters of stem cell research and regenerative medicine, which one is, is one of the main themes of this World Stem Cell Summit, the intersection of regenerative medicine and health span. They are a founding member of the 70 member Health Span Action Coalition, which I'm also very proud to lead. Melissa King and I forged this with another patient advocate, Sabrina Cohen, and we have put together an agenda to move the regulatory needle to keep up with innovation and bring this through health equity and distributive justice to the entire world. It's not about longevity. It's about health span and a healthy, healthy lifespan for all. So when, I, when, we, when the board of the Regenerative Mist Foundation did a survey of the organization which was almost the seed where all of this was planted. It was the Methuselah Foundation. And David Goebel, who founded this, Dane is his son, Florina is married to, to Dane. They're all part of the Goebel uh, family that have led this field so long. David attended early on World Stem Cell Summits. And I remember him giving an interview 
and he was asked, why are you here? Why am I here, he said, because I have friends who have died of liver cancer. That's why I am here today, for all of those persons. That has resonated with me for years. So I'm very proud to give the National Advocacy Award to the Methuselah Foundation and ask Lorena and Dane to accept it. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Thank you so much. Um, it's very humbling to, to get an award at all. Um, and I, I mean, really, I can, uh, um, I, I'm very, very, very grateful uh, to, to my dad and to the, the great bearded one back there for, for, for really kicking this thing off 20 years ago. I, it's kind of like that, the you know, daddy and daddy of, of, of this thing, you know? So I, I'm, I'm personally very, very uh, proud and, and humbled to have been uh, a fly on the wall and, and you know, somewhat of a contributor in, in, the, in the early days. And now, now the, you know, the, the really you know, fun part is, is, is going on. So we're, we're really, really, really far from, from being finished and we'll probably always have problems you know, um, but uh, we've got a, quite the decade ahead of us, and I'm just very, 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 very grateful uh, to be able to to try to help in a small way. And so, so thank you, Bernie, uh, for this. Oh yeah, don't worry, I'm not gonna. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm done now. Yeah, no, no one's ever accused me of being eloquent, so that's why. So, um, I guess obviously I married up. <laughs> uh, no. So uh, what was it, it? It honestly was. It honestly was kind of predestined because I, I started my career actually um, in the medical field, uh, and then I left it um, because I saw a broken healthcare system in the U.S. and I was just so frustrated. Um, and the folks, the people that I loved, were dying and were dying unnecessarily in my eyes. And so when I met Dane and became really good friends with David, my father-in-law, but also one of my best friends. Um, and met Aubrey de Grey as well, um, their vision became my vision. And this shared vision was what has inspired this wonderful adventure. You know, not many married couples are able to work together the way we have in two decades, but we've made it work because we care so much about extending the healthy human lifespan. And we are so fortunate to be able to work with brilliant people um, in longevity, in space, uh, in the, the life sciences um, who are actually concerned and want to move the needle forward. Um, and so we're so grateful. Bernie, thank you so much for this award. This is brilliant. Can't wait for the engraved one. <laughs> um, but, but we're so excited, and I know David would have loved to have been here. Just finally, just say thank you to, to the community. Like, we, we play a small part in really a very, very, uh, I think it's grown so much over the last 20 years. And, you know, Brian's here, where you've been kind of doing a lot of work for, for quite a while. Aubrey's here. But yeah, I just want to say thank you to the community. Thank you so much for, for all, the, all the hard work you did. <laughs>